Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Now platform engineering is a term you might have heard floating around a lot in the software development space just now. But what exactly is it? Is it a replacement for DevOps? Is it a new discipline entirely? Or is it just something else? In this video, we're gonna explain exactly what platform engineering is and how it came about. To do that, we'll go over a brief history of software development over the last 20 years or so, and talk a bit about Agile and DevOps and how we've arrived to needing platform engineering today. Now this video has an accompanying blog post. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. But let's not waste any time. Let's have a look at what software development looked like in the days before Agile. So before Agile was a thing, in software engineering, we used to just have regular old app developers. So I'm just gonna draw my developers quickly. So this is our team of developers and they used to quite happily write software. When they wanted the software to be tested, they'd throw it over the wall to a little tester or not so little to a tester, I should say. So this is my tester over here. And they say, hey, test it, please. Similarly, when we wanted the application to be built, we'd then hand it over to a different team who would do the building for us. So again, these builders would live outside of the team. And again, we'd say, build it. So the developers would develop the software, they'd then pass it over to a tester to test it and pass it over to a builder to build it. And that would be the application development. And then when it comes to time to run it in production, we'd then have an ops team. And again, this would be a separate team. So these guys would also live outside of the Agile team. I'll draw two ops guys because ops was gonna be a lot of work. Let's call these guys ops. And these ops guys do quite a lot of stuff. So they might deploy our application. They might also monitor it as well in production. And probably do a load of other stuff related to running it. It doesn't really matter. So this is what things used to look like. So we used to build the application in the development team. We'd send it over to a tester over here when we wanted it tested. We'd send it to a builder when we wanted it built. And we'd send it over to the ops team, throw it over the wall when we're ready for it to be run in production. So this is what things used to look like pre-Agile, before the Agile days. And truth be told, this was a lot simpler time in software engineering. The problem was is that it was incredibly inefficient. Like software would take ages to develop. You'd often only find bugs, for example, later on in the life cycle because the testers weren't in the team. It would take ages to build an application. And then, you know, because you had a separate ops team, deploying it, running it in production would often be a bit of a nightmare as well. So what did we do? Well, the first thing that happened is that we brought testers into the Agile team. Our testers gonna live in our team now. So again, this took quite a few years to do and there was quite a lot of resistance on both sides. But after a few years, most people agree that bringing testers into the Agile team has been a good thing and has sped up software development. Now in terms of the builder, well, along came something called Docker. Once we had Docker and containerization, most build stuff started to get done inside the team. So in some cases, we'd bring this builder guy into the team, or unfortunately, we'd just get rid of him altogether. So now we've got our app developers team. So we've got a team of developers who would write the code. We've got a tester who'll be able to test it. And we're using something like Docker or containerization to build it now. But of course, if we want to run it in production. We still need to send it over to a separate team, the ops team. And so this is where DevOps came along. So DevOps said no to these guys, these guys as well, these guys get brought into the team as well. So now we've got everyone in the one single team. And so this team became the DevOps team that we all know and love. So the culture of throwing stuff over the wall to the ops team is gone. Now everyone's in the same team and this team is now self-sufficient. And so this is mostly where we are today in the software development space and everything is fine and dandy, except it really isn't. There's a lot of problems that are appeared and we're gonna talk about those now. So this is what the landscape looks like today. So we've got various DevOps teams within our company. So these guys are building all different types of software, but the key thing is that they're all building software and they're supporting it for its whole life cycle. So from its development and testing right through to running it in production. So these guys here might be building business applications. This team here might be doing something like infrastructure as code. So let's just call this maybe the k 8 team, or Kubernetes team. These guys over here, they might be building internal security apps. So it doesn't really matter. We've got lots of different teams and they're all agile teams. They're all self-sufficient. They're all building different types of software for the organization. So these teams will all have their own different requirements and they'll be consuming different software that help their service or their application to run. As well as consuming external services, they might even consume services from one another as well. So for example, the business applications here, they probably consume stuff from the K8 team. 
and they probably consume stuff here from the security team as well. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that each of these teams have one or more microservices that they're responsible for. And the thing is, as time goes on, we keep in spinning up more and more services and it becomes a bigger, bigger load on these teams. Okay, that's fine. So let's just create another team that can help with all of this new load, or all of these new services. So I'm gonna spin up another new Agile DevOps team over here. And these guys can also do business apps, let's say. It doesn't really matter. Okay, we've spun up another new team to help with the additional load, the additional microservices that we keep producing. But there comes a point where you're suddenly getting too many microservices and too many teams. We can't just keep spinning up teams to support all of the different microservices that have long, long life cycles in production and that these teams are having to support. The software development continues to advance and progress. It becomes more and more complex. It's becoming a bigger, bigger burden on these teams to be able to support their software. On top of that, they want to keep developing and adding in new features as well. And then of course we have the tech layoffs that started following the COVID-19 pandemic. So suddenly teams started losing developers. And in some cases we started even losing whole teams. So my new team that was spun up here, these guys suddenly are already gone. But we still have all of the same microservices that need to be supported. For the teams and the engineers that are left, they're having to do more and more work just to keep up. And the organization are simply saying we need to do more with less. So what can we do? So down in the middle here, I'm gonna spin up another new team of devs. These guys I'm gonna draw in green. So these guys are a team of DevOps engineers, just like the others. We call these guys platform engineers. And what these platform engineers build is something called an internal developer platform, or IDP for short. We've got our IDP in the middle here. So what these platform engineers do is that they speak to the dev teams and they find out which tools that they're using to run their DevOps teams. Now what often happens, particularly when you've got many teams, is that the work to do to integrate with different services is often repeated many, many times on each different team. So for example, if this team's integrating with something like Renovate Bot for vulnerability updates, that work needs to be done in each team to do that integration. So what the platform engineers do is they look for common configuration that's being used in each team, and then they put that configuration into a central place, into this IDP. What happens is then that the other dev teams can then just consume directly from the IDP. Not these guys, because they're gone, unfortunately. So there might be common DevOps tasks in these teams, like dealing with security vulnerabilities, keeping, I don't know, Docker up to date, containers up to date, etc. All of that work can then be done in a central place in the IDP. So they essentially provide services here for the other teams to consume. What it means is that these DevOps teams can carry on doing their DevOps work, they can carry on staying self-sufficient, but they can just pull in their services from the IDP. It's already been configured and set up in the way that the organization wants. It all gets done in a central place. And of course, all of the various integrations that these services have, they need to be maintained, updated, etc. But all of that update work, that can now all just be done in this central place, in this internal developer platform in the middle. The other thing is that the DevOps teams, they can contribute back into the IDP. So if they have a particular configuration that they feel that other teams can benefit from, then they can just make PRs back into the IDP with that configuration. So they can contribute back and then other teams can pull, can pull their configuration like so, if it's useful for other people. So although other teams consume and they can make contributions to the IDP, it's important to note that the platform engineers, they own this IP IDP. The platform engineers own the IDP and they're responsible for its ongoing development. The IDP is just another piece of software, but it's another piece of software and its customers are the other DevOps teams within the organization. Now again, this is a very, very high level and we've not gone into any concrete examples, but this is in a nutshell what platform engineering is all about. So hopefully now you know a little bit more about what platform engineering is and how it came about. Now as a takeaway from this video, we can now clearly define the difference between a regular DevOps engineer and a platform engineer. So our DevOps teams, these guys have full control of the application lifecycle. So they do everything from building, testing, deploying and running their application. And these teams are mostly self-sufficient. Platform engineers on on the other hand, these guys provide an IDP, an internal developer platform, and these, this IDP has services that the DevOps teams can consume from. The mission of the platform engineers is to keep the DevOps engineers self-sufficient. The DevOps engineers in the organization, these guys are the customers of the platform engineers. Now, platform engineering is still very much in its infancy, but with the changing landscape in software development and with so much complexity being added and so much pressure being put on DevOps teams, there's not much doubt that it's going to grow and become a huge thing over the next few years. So if you found this video useful, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the like button and even consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me out and it really encourages me to keep making videos like this. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.